You're listening to WQEE 99.1 FM, the key in Noonan, Georgia, home of Braves country with Mac McGee and the armchair quarterbacks weekdays, 3 p.m. Eastern to 5 p.m. Eastern right here on the key and youtube.com at Braves country, Braves country today. We're talking Southern sports. We go live three to five weekdays right here on WQEE Braves country today, Southern sports talk with the voice of Braves country baseball, Mac McGee joined every day from sports analysts from all over Braves country, talking college football, the NFL, major league baseball, and what's trending in the world of sports. Braves country today. We go live three to five weekdays right here on WQEE. Armchair. There's something, I'll say there's something kind of about a kid that's never played baseball. <laughs> we have been hoodwinked, bamboozled, and flat out deceived. Why did you get so drunk? You got drunk. <laughs> I'm just really exhausted. What's in that cup? I'm a coax. Do you have any idea how important you this is? Have Try to stay idea? the pump pump. Really, this is you what you're doing? Idea? This is what you're doing? Chief, what do you want to do tonight? Same thing we do every night. Try to take over the world. 106 miles to Chicago. We got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes. It's dark, and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. Armchair. YouTube Live. Radio Station. The radio station you can call your own. You're listening to Braves Country with Mac McGee and the Armchair Quarterbacks. We're here live weekdays, 3 p.m. Eastern to 5 p.m. Eastern, WQEE 99.1 FM, The Key, and simulcasting on YouTube.com forward slash at Braves Country, your first choice for Southern sports. Good afternoon. I'm Mac McGee, and I don't know much, but I know one thing. Man, it's good to be in Boston, baby. Let's go. Armchair. Community Access Channel. He's the armchair quarterback. He's full of beer and he's full of snacks. All right, good afternoon, y'all. We are going to do something a little different, a little Braves Country Once Upon a Pastime series. You're in Braves Country. And joining me today on the Once Upon a Pastime series is Mr. Sergeant Timus Wooten. Sarge, how the hell are you, sir? Doing well, doing well. Looking forward to talking a little Red Sox history today. I did my homework. Yeah, so uh, what we're going to do in this in this hour, we're going to talk about the curse, maybe a little before, maybe a little after. But let's be honest, if you're above the age of Gen Z, you live the curse, right? You're Gen Z, man. You probably go do this Red Sox thing's pretty good, man. We, we <laughs> went all the time. This is this is awesome. We don't ever lose. This is awesome. Yeah, we've had a, a couple of down years here there, but you know, I don't know what all these Red Sox fans are complaining about. Uh, Sarge, just to give some people some background. What year do you think you started watching Red Sox baseball, give or take? Uh, I became a fan in 1986. I was 11 years old. 10. Okay, about to turn 11. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so for all intents and purposes, 86 is, is where it begins for you. Yeah. So it's your fault that Bill Buckner. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I. That was that was hard on my 11-year-old soul. the World Series that you began watching? Or were you able to consume any Red Sox baseball during the regular season in Florida? Well, because you grew then, up in Florida. Yeah, back then there was no MLB package or anything, so... Right. Uh, they did spring training in Winter Haven back then before they moved to Fort Myers. And I went to a Sox game and came home 
told my mom, I was like, you know, I met Jim Rice, Don Baylor, Wade Boggs. And uh, so you live close to Winter Haven. Yeah, I did growing up. Yeah. And okay. so I went and I come home and, you know, my mom's big baseball person and she's what taught me the game. But all my family's National League Braves fans. And I was like, I'm going to be a Red Sox fan. And she's like, well, they don't win much. So if you're going to like them, you have to like them even when they lose. And they usually do. And we lost the World Series that year. Cried for three days. Been a fan ever since. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, Jim Rice because I was a big Jim Rice fan as a kid. But now I see, I started playing fantasy baseball at a very young age. I was one of those ones that found it, and you could you could mail it off in, from the uh, Baseball Weekly, I think is what it was called, and you could mail off your your uh, your, your lineups. And Jim Rice, I always handed up on it. I did not know until the other day it came up, it came up on one of my turn back times. Um, that I always do for the Braves country baseball broadcasts in July. Oh man. Uh, 88, I think was the year July is either 87 or 88 of July. Jim Rice got suspended by the Red Sox for three games. I don't remember this for shoving manager Joe Morgan in the dugout because they pinch hit for him. Yeah. Do you remember Spike Owen? Yeah, yeah, second baseman. Yeah. Okay, so people who don't remember Spike Owen, Spike Owen sucked. Okay, he was a light hitting, and he pinch hit for him, and so he gave him a hard shove, and they suspended him for three games. Man, I feel like I feel like I should remember that Sports Center was around, but maybe they just didn't cover it that well. I don't remember. Well, yeah, I mean, and in Florida during the regular season, you I followed them through the newspaper, you know, and then on yeah, Saturdays. Saturdays, you would usually get to see a Red Sox game nationally televised. Um, so, I mean, I that's what I do on Saturday after that's Saturday morning. Cartoons. In Winter Haven and the Red Sox are being broadcasted in that area because that's essentially their spring home. Right. Is that what yeah. you read the Red Sox over other teams? Okay. Yeah. Uh, was that or the Yankees? The Yankees were right down the street in uh, Lakeland, which is about, I guess, 30 minutes past Winter Haven. Um, okay. So it was either the Yankees or the Red Sox, and uh, I prayed for the Red Sox <laughs> instead of the Yankees. But yeah, right. and, but I followed them every day. In Jacksonville, in Jacksonville, we literally got the game of the week, whatever the national, you name it, game. Of, so I, I remember what you're talking about. They had Saturday afternoon NBC game of the week. Yeah. But there were always a ton of teams being broadcasted but we got whatever they thought we wanted. So we didn't get a consistent team. So yeah. one week you might get the Tigers and Angels because Reggie Jackson is having a good year or whatever. The next week you turn around and it, and it would be the Dodgers versus the Padres. So it's funny. I remember growing up watching those, but I, I remember not caring about those because I, I, I would tune in because it was my only way to, to watch other teams. But the Braves were so bad. Yeah. We still got to be on TBS at night because nobody wanted to put us on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah the, was like, are we going to watch Tigers, Yankees, or are we going to watch the Braves? Tonight? We're not doing both. I'm like, oh, screw it. <laughs> Let's go outside then. I'll I'll watch the Braves tonight. Yeah. The, get within, you know, nine games of 500. Boy, those are some lean years back in the oh. Dale Murphy years and stuff. Woo. Lord. Yeah. Murphy. My my first year, like yours, first full year of watching the Atlanta Braves, I I was fortunate. It was 1982. They they won the division. They actually started out 13 and 0 that year. Okay, but hell, I'm thinking, dude, this is a great idea. I'm gonna pick the Braves. Oof! Little did I know, 83 till what was it, 90? 83 to 90. Oh man, 91, yeah. Uh, people wonder why I became such a big football fan in the 80s. Like, dude, we were sucked. We were always bad. Yeah, it, I mean, unbearably bad. I mean, because the Braves are my National League team, but I've always been an American League Red Sox fan. Right. And so my family, all diehard National League Braves fans, 
But so, you know, I watched. Well, you know, the thing is, too, it's very difficult to have two baseball teams in your lifetime, like two, like you could say, yeah, man, I know everything about because your team plays every single day. Yeah. And if you're going to be a big fan, you're, you get consumed with the Red Sox, the Braves, whoever your team is, right? Yeah. So, and if you're a Red Sox fan, you also have to study the Yankees as well. And vice versa. If you're a Yankees fan, you study the Sox because, right. especially, you know, and. Yeah. I'm, I'm more likely to watch a Mets or Phillies game than I will a Tampa Bay Rays game that I'm supposed to be a quasi, you know, halfway pull for him, but I really don't. Cause first of all, I, I can't, I can't see the games in Florida. Usually They're usually blacked out. So I end up watching more Phillies and Mets games <laughs> to your point. I watch my rivals more than I watch other teams that I say that I like better. Yeah. Cause I want the bastards to lose. <laughs> yeah. And I want to see, you know, how many swings, Giancarlo Stanton gets in before the next injury, you know, so things like right. that. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's funny. The only time I ever got into where I was watching two teams at once is when I worked in the restaurant business and stayed up late. I typically would watch West coast baseball when I got home. That's the only time I can remember getting into it, but it really came down to what my schedule was like. I didn't stay up, but if they, but if I got home and they were on, I tended to watch the San Francisco Giants a lot. But I don't remember the last time I watched a Giants fan, Giants game that, that they weren't playing the Braves. <laughs> and my only reason for even pulling for the Giants is I hate the Dodgers so much. I was like, well, I got to pick for a team out here. I who who do the Dodgers hate? Yes, go Giants. That was my that was my reasoning. Yeah, that's how I fell into the Padres thing. I was like, well, they're not the Dodgers. <laughs> Right. I get that. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and get into the, the break, uh, the, uh, almost said Boston Braves. I have Boston Braves on my mind. Uh, the Boston Red Sox and we're, let's say, okay. I think before we talk about the curse, we need to kind of set this up and talk about how good the damn Red Sox were before the trade of the Bambino. Right. Royal and the, yeah, they were one of the top teams in Major League Baseball. Yeah. They had won the series, what, in 03, which was the first World Series. Right. It's, we, it's Pittsburgh, the Pilgrims. We won uh, five. What's that? Before. We won five between 03 and 18, if I'm not mistaken. It was the Boston Americans. Was it the Pittsburgh Pilgrims? Is that what they were called? I always have pilgrims in my head. And for some reason I thought it was Boston, but I, I'm, I'm thinking that's Pittsburgh. So it was Boston versus Pittsburgh in the first world series in 03. They started in 01 and they are intertwined the Braves and the Red Sox because they're in the same city, the Braves, which went through a million name changes, but, but they were the original team in Boston, the national league, the senior circuit. Mm -hmm. And when the Boston American league team comes on the Americans at the time, they started poaching players from the Braves organization. And at that time, I think they were actually called the Bean Eaters. But Boston National League was getting poached by Boston American League. The Boston National League team was also getting poached from other American League teams. And it was going on for both leagues because these guys didn't have some, you know, they, they didn't have some loyalty. They were unrestricted free agents quite a bit because they were two separate leagues. So screw you. You don't want to pay me. I'll go over here. Well, we'll banish you from our league. I don't care. I'm going to go play for their league. And a lot of this was going on in the very beginnings of baseball, how the, how the American league and national league became one and became, came intertwined is because they decided to pair up together and let's, let's quit letting the players pin us against each other. And we'll screw them instead. <laughs> so that's, you know, follow the money, right? Right. Yeah. That's ownership right there. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. the American spirit. <laughs> yeah. So they win the series in 1903, 1912, 1915, 1916. And then 1918. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. I always think of the 
Yes. I always think of the curse being 18, but yes, the curse didn't actually start until after 1918. Yeah, we won the World Series in 18. And then we went on a little bit of a dry spell. So five World Series championships from 03 to 18, so 16 seasons. Yeah. We were the Yankees, basically. Right. And then you traded the Bambino, Babe Ruth. Uh, to- it was for a good cause. Well, I again, mean, Nanette. I mean, if you no, if no, you Nanette. Can't. Yeah, that's still sweeping the nation. <laughs> If you can't support the, if you can't support the arts, man. What can- <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the first time that's ever been uttered on Armchair Quarterback Radio. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that might be the first time ever uttered out of your mouth. Honestly, <laughs> can't support the arts. What are we doing in life? What are, What are we here for, man? What's this all about? Ah. Oh. No, 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 net. Why? We we- Austin, at that time, we would have been shot and killed because oh. we would we would have rioted like the 2020 riots. But the difference is, they just would have shot you and said, "No, nah, no, nah, we're not, we're not letting this escalate." <laughs> yeah, it's best to nip this one at the bud. Bang! I'm gonna miss him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was he was lunging at my pocket. Okay, well, you know, <laughs> well, he, he had it coming. <laughs> <laughs> can you here's what people never talk about though about that trade can you imagine what went through babe ruth's mind when they called and said hey we're not only trading you which is mind-boggling but we're trading you to the yankees and he's like well who are the Sox getting for me oh nobody nobody we're, i mean it's honestly for years and years and years in Major League Baseball, that 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 was actually a common practice for a lot of teams. Teams, team management, ownership, they did terrible job at keeping the baseball team and whatever their other entities were separate. And so you and that is the reason why Kansas City jokingly became known as the farm club of the New York Yankees cuz Kansas City would get all these great players and the Yankees would just go buy them. And for the longest time, Kansas City, the Kansas City Athletics, who were originally the Philadelphia Athletics, to become the Oakland Athletics. And who are now the AAA team for the Yankees. <laughs> who are the AAA team for the Atlanta Braves now, right? Because you got right. two, two, two all-stars in the infield came from the Oakland Athletics. So it all comes full circle. Yeah, it know? does. When in doubt, you know, if you ever meet an old Philadelphia athletic fan, one that's been through been through the times, you know, it's the late 1880s till now, you get you got at least you know buy that man a beer, shake his hand. <laughs> I would he- shake him very hard because if he went through that, he's 117 years old right now. Hey, even more reason. Oh well, yeah, buy him a Metamucil, but you don't want to buy him a beer. That'll kill him. I guarantee he's only going to want to talk about the early 1970s. <laughs> Three World Series back to back. We had Reggie Jackson. <laughs> Anyways, back to the rest of the story. We got uh, the Red Sox. They trade what was little. Little did we know at the time about to become the home run king. Now at the time he was known as a phenom, but. The home run really didn't take off till after he was traded to the Yankees. Yeah. And the and game had changed. The ball had changed. The, you know, I've talked about this before, but one of the reasons why the home run took off in the time period that it did, A, they started using new balls very regularly. You didn't wear this this old clompy thing full of mud by the ninth inning, right? And so it, it was a better baseball to hit. But also... There were a lot of stadiums at that time in the 1900s, early 1900s, and into early part of Babe Ruth's career, they didn't have bleachers. So these home runs didn't happen because the guy could drift back and catch your damn ball because there was no wall. <laughs> so when they started, when the money started, when, one of the reasons why it became a thing 
1914 Braves pulled on this miracle comeback to win the pennant. And when they went to go play in the World Series, they played at something called the South End Grounds. The South End Grounds only had grandstands behind home plate and stands down the right and left field line. There, there was no uh, bleachers, right? They played the World Series in Fenway Park because you had more seating capacity. And at that point, they're like, we got to put some freaking seats in this thing. So they yeah. played in Fenway Park in 1914 and in the spring of 1915 until the completion of the, of the, uh, what they ended up calling Braves Field, Boston Braves Field. So once again, intertwined because the, the Braves were using the Red Sox stadium, right? But when they traded the Bambino, they couldn't have known. That you know, I mean, the guy was already one of the best left-handed pitchers in baseball, and he was showing promises as a very good hitter. Well, they didn't think it was gonna be 714 home runs later. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I mean, no one had done remotely that, so there was no way they would have known. However, still though, you trade well, okay, him. Way. 1923. Babe Ruth breaks the home run record, the all-time home run record. The number that he hit to break the record, I won't even ask you because it's so low, you're going to be like, what? 139th home run made him the all-time home run king. What? 139. That's like a year and a half in Royd in, in Roy universe. You know right. I mean? That's like, I was fixing to say that was Chipper Jones' fourth year. Season. Yeah. Okay. Barry Bonds did that in a season and a half. Yeah, Barry Bonds did that like in a week, just about, it seemed like. Uh but once again, you think about some of these home runs. Now look, a lot of home runs are crushed, right? If you think about some of these home runs that are hit nowadays, not in, you know, not just stay our entire lifetime, how many of them barely clear the wall? Well, back in the day. They did. There was no wall to clear. You just jerked it back and caught the ball. Or it went over your head and you, went, you were able to get it. And that's why the all-time triples record will never be be beaten at 309. The dimensions are different. You're never going to get 309 triples in your career. No, you're not going to hit it into the triangle at Fenway 309 or 310 times to break the record. And that's the only way that's ever going to happen. Those triples are hard. Days that lead the league with triples, it's like five. <laughs> yeah. And so, you're like five. Holy cow. Where were you? Right. Playing? I, yeah. I rem actually remember that actually being a thing as a kid growing up, pulling for Vince Coleman to hit triples to lead yeah. the league. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Boy, that went by the wayside once the steroids came out. Well, contact went beside. <laughs> yeah, well, well, that's it. We're going to start juicing. And we're going to bring the walls in and bye-bye triple. Yeah. And yeah, it was like shot out of a potato gun. So, yeah. But I forgot about boy Vince Colt. That dude could flat out fly. Flat out fly around the bases. Yeah. Well, he was from my hometown, so I, I became a fan of him. And so because of that, I, I watched a lot of St. Louis games because they, they were on TV a lot. Yeah. When I was a kid, because of Vince Coleman, people would think, "Oh, well, you were watching because you, they, they were on TV because they were the Redbirds, Whitey Herzog, Ozzy Smith." List goes on and on and on. Go, nope, they were on TV in Jacksonville because <laughs> Vince Coleman was on the team, and he was one of the few players that had made it. Yeah, I watched it for the Oz. Obviously, I mean, I thought he was, I, I, I thought he was not even human. And then, oh, what, uh, Vince Coleman, and what was the long, lanky, ugly dude, McGee? What was his name? Oh, long, lanky, ugly dude? <laughs> For what yeah, team? For the Cardinals with Vince Coleman. He looked like J.J. Willie McGee? Huh? Willie McGee? Willie McGee. Yeah, he looked hey, like man, J.J. from Good Times. Another mother. Don't be talking about McGee's, baby. That's yeah. a good looking man. <laughs> Is he? He looked like J.J. from Good Times. Hey, man, he was good times to watch. Yeah, he was. He had a wingspan. 
I mean, Eagles were jealous of. <laughs> he was. I, I probably need to um, do do a once upon a pastime t- series on this, but the triples, the where the way they died, <clears throat> the all time triples leader, three hundred nine, Sam Crawford and Ty Cobb's just blew him at two ninety seven. But when you look at their first season in Major League Baseball or their last season of Major League Baseball, there's no one at the top of the list, nowhere near the top of the list, that was born in the second half of the 20th century or that that played the second half. The closest is Willie Mays, 1973, 64, 64th on the list, 140 triples. He, he didn't even get half of what yeah Cobb and if had. and if say hey willie didn't make half it's never being broken yeah so that's and and that's why now Trish speaker is a guy that is that that, that was one of the greats of the boston americans and red sox Trish Speaker, known as the Gray Eagle, the the uh, the Hall of Famer, his nickname was where, along with Gray Eagles, they used to say his glove is where triples go to die because he was running out there in the freaking fields catching 450-foot bombs. <laughs> that more, that nowadays, they just trot around the bases. There was, I'll put it this way. There was no bat flipping back then because of one main reason. You better get to running, son. <laughs> and if you showed a pitcher up back then, God help the person coming up behind you and you the next time through because they're going to – he's still going to be in the game and he's going to drill you right in the rib cage or in the ear, whatever, you know. They didn't play back then. The umpires right. let the players police the game back then, and they did with an iron right. fist. Right, but with that all aside, you, you, you put that aside, they weren't show bunnings. They didn't have time to show because they had to run. Right, yeah. There was no, that ball's gone. There is no gone, you jackass. He's going to run, you big ball. dummy. What are you, what are you an admirer no. for? Yeah. No. <laughs> you fat dummy, run. <laughs> no. And they, were all, and they were all playing for, you know, they were playing for a lot less and trying to keep, you know, the lights on in their house and all that kind of stuff. So there, there was no showboating. No, they were playing for food money back then, man. I, <laughs> you imagine their wives? Oh, yeah. Yeah, real real good. You stood there and watched it? <laughs> That's our job. You big dummy run. So the Boston Red Sox win their last championship in 1918. And that's where we're going to take a real quick break when we come back. We're going to talk about the curse of the Bambino that led all, was it 86 years? 86 years. And you can tell the Sarge is over it. Like, you know, it's fine. It's fine. (laughs) We'll be back in a flash here on Once Upon a Pastime series, Braves Country, the Red Sox curse. Hello there. Oh, what fresh hell is this? (laughs) I'm not audible. How audible are you? Red Polly, Red Polly, Blue Poncho, Blue Poncho. Do it, do it. Rambo, Rambo. Give me two shot here. Richmond, New York. Richmond, Florida. Tally, Buffalo. Check, check. Hey, Short Ox. Do the Raiders. Red Polly. Omaha. I'm out. I'm Cher. I'm Amy Lawrence, and I'm up late, always, after hours, hanging out with you on CBS Sports Radio. Check it out, 2 a.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. Pacific. Oh, wow, I'm pretty sure that's going to be a, yeah, there it is, another flag on the play. Multiple flags on the play. Holding, offense number 97. That penalty was declined. Touchdown. After the play, unsportsmanlike conduct. Offense number 22. Penalty will be applied to the kickoff. This is going to be one of the strangest calls. That son of a... You playing against Dick this week? Yeah. Could be worse, man. When I played against him, he ejected all my players. What? Armchair. Of all baseball's ancestors, town ball was by far the most popular. Under its rules, the infield was square. Eight to 15 men played on a side. 
sometimes as many as 50. The pitcher or feeder was the least important player. It was his job to lob the ball to the striker, who could wait and wait for the pitch he wanted. The runner was out if the ball was caught on the fly, or if he was soaked, hit with the ball while running between bases. You're listening to Braves Country Baseball. Please like and subscribe today, youtube.com forward slash at Braves Country. Welcome back. Got a question for you. Nowadays, if you soaked a player, <laughs> is he out? Can you just throw a hall off and hit the guy with the ball? Because <laughs> <laughs> I can think of some Mets and Phillies I'd like to see soaked. I uh, was fixing to say, I'm glad Pedro, it's a good thing Pedro Martinez didn't know that rule because, whoo! <laughs> Man, I'll tell you what, how fun would the game be if you were over there, if you added an element of dodgeball into that? You know? Right? You can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a baseball. Goodness <laughs> gracious. Ball be bouncing around. And don't let it be a dead ball once it, get in the, once it gets in the dugout. <laughs> Make them go get it. Yeah. Make Slide them, right on in. Go, di- go digging under all all the different you know water bottles and everything like that. Or <laughs> that man, that's good times right there. Jim Leland uh, be sitting there smoking a cigarette, ashing on you while you're trying to get the ball underneath him. So the great superstitious sports curse of the Bambino, arguably one of the very first ones. There's only a couple that I could think of that predate it. And I don't think any of them are as, as famous. We talked about this on the Cubs once upon a pastime. The Cubs, when you talk about the Cubs curse, they lasted for 108 years. Actually, lasted longer than the Red Sox curse. They can't even agree on what the hell the curse was because there was two. Well, it's main- to do with a goat, right, or something? There was a Billy Goat in 1945, but before that, in 19, was it 08? They were playing the Giants in the regular season. Anyways, I won't go into today, but it's called uh, Merkel's Boner. Fred Fred Merkel made a boneheaded play. Back then, a boner meant something totally different. And, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> goat meant something different, right? Remember your brother, kid? You were the goat that was something bad? Oh, yeah. man. You don't want to be the goat. Now somehow they turn that around. Everybody wants to be the goat. Yeah. But he was literally Merkel's boner was literally Fred Merkel was the goat that caused the giants to lose the pennant essentially. And giants fans would claim until 1945 of the Billy goat that the Merkel boner was the reason why the Cubs couldn't win another world series it was because the one that they won in 08, which was a back to or might have been a seven anyways it was the second of a back-to-back world championship they said it was gotten you know off of ill-gotten gains basically and that you'll you'll never win another one so they can't even agree to it everybody knows the bambino yeah looks so weird seeing him in a red Sox jersey it is it's wonderful though it really it's heartbreaking at the same time look how skinny he is dude he was like that most of his career i've talked about this before the, the the chuckleheads that get on social media go, oh, boy, Babe Ruth couldn't play in today's game. He's too fat. You were seeing him in the 1930s when the video got less grainy and he was, like, playing for the Boston Braves in his late 30s and was, you know, could barely walk at that point. Babe Ruth was an athlete. Any guy that was the best left-handed pitcher of his time and the best home run hitter of his time was athletic. Ask Shohei Otani. That's about the yeah. only guy. You can risk. Yeah, there is no other. Yeah. So that that always drives me crazy when people. I'm like, I know why they say it because the handful of clips they've seen are either slowed down, they're very grainy, or they were from the tail end of his career. Or so they saw the John Goodman movie. Yeah, there's no sports center highlights from the 1914 Boston Red Sox. Dang well should be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the curse of the Bambino. I'm going to let you take this away on getting sold off to the Yankees and what and how we then 
what what would you say after the after the cur- you know after the sell the sale the no 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 he's gone move on with it what would you say would be the first one that you would lean to goes up oh, the curse is real uh, I would think what was the year when uh oh Teddy Ball game was World War II and, and Teddy Ball game is in the prime of his career right? that's the season you know Teddy's going to bring us to the promised land and all this and then the World War II happens and people are like okay that's a little bit of bad luck and then you get players i mean think of to me i don't do it to just one specific thing Think about the players oh, that think went. Don't work. <laughs> think about the players that went through that organization in eighty-six years. Yes, I mean Ted William. Ted Williams. I mean these players. The seventy-five about? series. Against I was the trying Reds. to pull it up. I can't think of his name. But the guy that famously got blasted in the eye. Um, uh, Tony C. Yeah. Uh, is it Caligliari or something like that? Calig- yeah, it's hard for me to say. Um, okay. But yes, Tony C. Yes. Uh, he he was like, looked upon as the next great thing. Basically, the heir apparent to uh, nobody was going to be Ted Williams, but he, but he was going to take the torch. Right. Um, and he gets blasted in the eye and he's never the same. He's out. He plays two more seasons, but he's never the same. He's out of baseball two years later. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna rattle some off to you and just ha- have you react to them because I pulled some up that are kind of highlighted. I mean, my God, there's 18 to 20 of them, but I'm gonna hit the I'm gonna hit the high notes. Okay, <laughs> whoever wrote this man probably has a pistol in his mouth right now. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> or or the 2004 season took it out of it. Yeah. Uh, Okay, in 1946, they appear in the first World Series since the sale of Babe Ruth, favored to beat the Cardinals, went to a seventh game. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the bottom of the eighth, the score's tied 3-3. Three to three. Cardinals Zena Slaughter on first, Harry Walker at the plate. On a hit and run, Walker hit a double to short center. Slaughter ran through the third base coach's stop sign and beat Boston Johnny Presley's Johnny Pesky, excuse me, uh, relay throw to home. So the guy Man. should have been held up. He ran through the stop sign. They scored anyways. That's kind of number one. Well, the, the guy that the, that scored said he w- was round. He caught the Red Sox infield asleep. Asleep. He's like, when he rounded third, he's like, I can score. And then Pesky, the Boston papers were all over him because they said he pulled the ball down before he threw it, and that split second is what cost that run. Now, it's Pesky, crap. Famous Johnny Pesky from the Pesky Bowl, right? That's the same one, right? Yeah. It's got to mm-hmm. be. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, so, yeah, uh, they hung some horns on Pesky. Should have never happened, but they said, oh, yeah, he pulled the ball down before he threw it, and that cost him time. It's a load of crap. The guy was just running like he was stole had stolen something, and he did catch the Red Sox infield asleep, and he decided to score on him. It's one of those things that happened. It's called baseball, right? All right. It's called Red Sox baseball. 1948, finished the regular season tied with the Cleveland Indians. First ever one-game playoff. Because back, th- back before then, they were doing best of three. And then they, they actually went back to the best of three. But anyways, it's first ever one game playoff. Cleveland would win it and they would go on to win the World Series. The last World Series, by the way, for the Cleveland franchise. In 49, the Red Sox need just one win of the last two games to win the pennant, lose both games to the Yankees, yeah. who win the World Series. And they would win the World Series not just that year. The Yankees were going to win from 49 to 53. They just needed one win of the last two. Instead, 
the Yankees. In 67, we're getting a little closer. I'm going to jump a couple. In 1967, winning the AL pennant, they go to the World Series. <clears throat> and once again, they're heading to a game seven. And Bob Gibson goes out there and fires a masterpiece. Yeah, that's the that's Gibson what I was thinking. Run in the game off a of Lawnberg. Realize something Bob Gibson. too. Sixty-seven. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I just know this to be true. Uh, Nineteen sixty-seven regular season. Bob Gibson broke his leg in the middle of the season and was out almost two months. He came back like a few weeks before the World Series. So he wasn't even really firing on all cylinders, all, this, all you know, so to speak. But he just goes out there and throws three complete, pre, complete shutout, uh, complete games, earn, gives up no earned runs in in three uh, appearances in the uh, '67 series. Yeah, a broken Bob Gibson was better than anybody else. Let's be honest. I mean, it, it, Broke his leg. I know. Not like Gee. they use those in pitching. <laughs> First time I came across it. I was doing one of those turn back times, right? And I was like in early July. It says on this date, 1967, Gibson Brooks is breaks like he couldn't have been 67. They, they he went on to be the the MVP of the World Series. What the hell? And, the, and two months later, he's back on the mound. Going, Never mind. <laughs> like what? And then I'm gonna skip that one. This one is more famous. 1975. Yeah. Red Sox win the pennant. The Red Sox are against the Reds. The Reds, yeah. Game yeah. six, Carlton Fiss pushes it down the line, sets the stage for game seven. Pete Rose famously said in that game on the field to one of his teammates, I believe it was the shortstop, but it could have been anybody, on the field as Fisk was – Rounding the the bases, isn't this great? Is this not the best game you've ever been a part of? Yeah. And whoever goes, what are you crazy? We just lost. He goes, oh, we're gonna win game seven, man. You just embrace that we were in this one, which would not have been my take if I was a fan or a player. But that just tells you Pete Rose thought a little differently. Yeah, he was a he's a different breed for real, real. Put him in the hall. That's a show for another time. Nineteen seventy eight. The Boston Red Sox have a 14-game lead over the Yankees in what is now famously known as the Boston Massacre by fans. They, with six days, three-and-a-half game lead over the Yankees, long story short, somebody by the name of Bucky bleep, Dent cracks a three-run home run in the seventh inning over the Green Monster, giving the Yankees a three to two lead. They went on to win the game five to four and eventually the World Series. You know what's funny about that game? Nothing. When you're a kid growing up watching and hearing learning about it. It in your mind, even though you know it doesn't make any sense, it seemed like it was a walk off. Yeah. Right? For yeah. Even though he's right. on the road. Even though he's on the road, right? It, it seemed like a walk-off when I, was a, when I was a kid. I'm like, wait a minute, that couldn't have been right. Well, that must have been the ninth inning. That was the seventh inning. Yeah, we, we had another six outs to... Nine outs, Just, right? It was the seventh inning. Yeah, yeah, the nine out. We had nine outs. Yeah. No, I will say that what's what's different about that in today's game is the home run wasn't as... as uh, did not show up as often. So when you had a lead late in the game, that it felt a lot more secure than what it does today. So that takes us to 1986, your beginning of your fandom. And I still can't watch that play. Mookie Wilson. See, now you're just pissing me off. I still can't watch and uh, Vin Scully's call every time it's a freaking and he's a Dodger he's the Dodger call what is he even doing calling the game first and foremost but 
Oh, when he says behind the back, he, dude, I still he, have to. Well, he was the famously, the, he was the uh, national play-by-play guy for television. Yeah, I know, but still. So it's just like I always for years, think of him with the Dodgers, though. I never really, you know, but. But for years, he was the. He was the guy, I know. I mean, I still, for my money, the best ever to do it was him and uh, Joe Garagiola on the mic. It was the same time period. It was uh, NBC. They would do the, the Saturday game of the week, and then they would do the playoffs. Yeah, uh, Vince Scully was going to be hard to beat, yeah. But, and, and, and here's a thing. Here's a thing about Buckner. Now, listen, should he have made the play? Absolutely. Was he playing on two broken ankles? Yes, he was. Was it hard for him to bend over? Yes. Should he have made the play? He should have. He did not cost us the World Series. He may have cost us that game, but there was a game seven. It was over if Buckner hadn't have made that error. We would have won the series that but Butner did not cost us the World Series in 1986. That guy had a bad rap for years. He couldn't show his face in Boston until 04. So the other thing about it is, I'm trying to, was, it, was his name Calvin Schiraldi? Is that, what, is that what his name was? It was something like that. Um, Calvin's the starting pitcher or the pitcher in the game. He, he threw wild pitches to get that going. Oh, there was a lot more. Buckner just, it's the most famous play of that game. But we were handing that game back to the Mets. And, I mean, and think about that Mets team, though. They were stacked. You can't give them that many no, extra no. outs. It was Calvin Schiraldi. I thought I thought it was, um, you know, they were down to their last strike. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, 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 was, I, was, I, was, I was watching that game. I know. I know. Ray Knight single to center. Carter. What was it? I wanted. I'm trying to remember how this went down, but singles to center. Carter scored from second. Mitchell goes to third. I thought Carter, I thought Carter scored the winning run. I might be wrong. I can't ever watch no, no, that no, no, play, no. so no, I could be wrong. Ray Knight scored the winning run because he's leaping up and down. I, I, I That's that. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always hated Ray Knight because of it. And I wasn't, you know, I'm not a Red Sox fan per se, but I was pulling for the Red Sox because I did not want to see the Mets win the World Series. And I I remember, oh man, I remember it was yesterday. That that was one of the first times that I firmly started believing in the superstition of if you're watching a game and something's working, you you don't move. And if you do go to go to the restroom, you better get back to where you were. Yeah, yeah. You better be leaning against that same wall because I remember I was a kid. I was I was sitting on the bed, and I mean my leg was falling asleep. I was sitting on like the, on the back of my foot, you know, you know, like almost like in, Indian style, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And finally I was like, man, I got it. It was starting to hurt. I moved that leg out and then freaking jerk leg got the single. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to move it back. It didn't work. The whole thing had fallen apart. After that, I was like, it's, it's real, man. It's real. It's real. So now to this day, if I'm not, do, if I'm doing games, totally different. I got a whole thing up here in this coconut with all kinds of pregame rituals if it's a big game for the Braves broadcast I'm doing it there's only certain colors I will wear if they're playing certain teams it's a whole nine yards but I just drink <laughs> if I'm doing the game I you know obviously I'm moving around there's not but if I'm just watching like a football game or something of a team I really like or whatever dude if something's working it is it is go time don't touch me <laughs> Don't breathe on me. Don't you try to hand me the lighter to light my cigarette. Damn it. I'm like, my it's just, don't no, what are you doing? I think I got that from my dad. I can specifically remember us watching uh, Florida State football games and it would come back from commercial 
and he would look at you and he would say, all right, where the hell were we? Meaning he'd be standing up against the wall, leaning one way, boy, you better be back in that seat and, and sit in the way you were that whole nine yards. It's real, man. If you don't think it's real, ask Ray Knight because it's my fault. <laughs> Thanks for that, by the way. Yeah. That was a nuts. Fun little trip down memory lane there. Yeah, if they would have just held on and beat the Mets, they'd still be talking about 1969 instead of 1986. I mean, you, I can still see the Rocket and Boggs and all those guys on the top step of the dugout, you know, just waiting, smiling, laughing. You know, the guy that was one of my favorite players on that on that 86 squad was uh, Dave Henderson. No, Dave, Henderson. Dave Henderson, yeah, a couple like of home one once against once one against the the Mets and one against the Angels. Of back then, it was the most showboating you could do and get away with it. Where he hit the home run, he was almost backpedaling in a in a yeah, spin. and he starts hopping, yeah, yeah, he, he and then he put his head down and run. That's the yeah. most you could get away with. Yeah. And the fact he was a big old boy, you, you didn't want him rushing the mound. No, you could drive a Volkswagen through that gap in his teeth, too. That's what I always remembered about him. Yeah. You, but I, you yeah, I, every time I think of Dave, I think of that hop. That's that's what pops in my head immediately is that he just, he's that's so like happy. That. Yeah. The Angels in the ALCS. Yeah. In Anaheim, I remember it was sunny. You know, th this is back when they played the ALCS during the daytime. Yeah. Yeah. So game seven, they lose it. Yeah. And the last one that they really talk about, see in 88 and 90, they got to the ALCS, but the, the last real one was 2003 Grady little leaving Pedro in what, are, what were your thoughts? Why are you doing this? He's done, and it's Pedro. Of course he's going to say I'm good because he's Pedro. And what pitcher worth his salt says, yeah, I'm done. Take me out. No, nobody. Grady. They had a 5-2 to two lead in the eighth. Grady Little stays with them. Now, Dude, be I, honest with us. At the very time before he, he gave it up, were you, were you saying take him out, or were you like, ah, oh, it's Pedro. Leave him in. I, I thought Pedro was done. Like I was at a bar and watching it and a couple of the Red Sox fans were like, no, it's you know, Pedro. I was like, he, he's, he had, you could tell his velo has, was starting to, to drop and he was starting to miss, but Pedro was still throwing strikes if he missed back in the, especially back then. And, but he, he just, he could tell his arm was jello and there's no they reason. By the way, the Yankees just get people up to speed. They scored three runs in that inning, tying the guy, tying the game at five to five on a single in three doubles. So there were multiple opportunities to pull him. To pull him. Yeah. You get to the dugout and he gives up that single. Okay. Go get him. All right, Pedro, you had your shot. Go get him. But, but he didn't. He just Dump. sat there and watched like he had in some vegetative state or something. I don't know. I almost got thrown out of that bar. <laughs> it wouldn't have been the first time, let's be honest. But that night for sure, I bes bes just beside myself. I was no fun at all. <laughs> so <laughs> we gave up that, 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 that lead. So then Tim Wakefield comes in, bottom of the 11th. Aaron Boom launches a home run. First pitch. Off, off. They barely back from commercial. You know, Kevin Millar said, he just said, hey, coming down, the ball hadn't even reached the dugout to roll in from the infield. Wake through the pitch, and he heard crack, and he turned and looked. He's like, I never even saw the pitch. I heard it, and I looked up, and I was like, our season just ended. Who was that? They said that Kevin Millar. Oh, Millar. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
<laughs> they just got back from commercial. I thought it was like a replay from something. Of course, and back then. All then. Of, a sudden, of course, back then it was like a half hour commercial break. <laughs> yeah, it was a Yankee Sox game, so it was like seven hours long. And but I do not miss that. I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't miss that part of baseball. I don't know. The, uh, the four to five minute commercial breaks during the postseason, the three and a half minute commercial breaks during the regular season. And you didn't really realize it at the time when you're a fan, and you're having drinking a cold one, and you're, you know, maybe hanging out with friends, right? I'd be lying if I said you noticed it. But now that it's changed, I'm like, God, this is better, man. It's yeah, it's way better. I mean, it gave you time. Things this 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 I love. Yeah, this is that's I mean, because back then we, we were smokers, It'd give you time to go out, you can have a whole cigarette and not even have to rush, you know. You would even right. have to hot box it. Um yeah, that watching watching Wake. Did you did I lose you, bud? For a second, your uh, your uh, video is not on, but uh, um, I can okay. hear. Okay. Uh, hear you. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, watching yeah. Wake's expression, as I mean, his head just was all I saw for six months from October to April, between o three and o four season. God help Wake and Wake was such a huge part of why we were there to begin with. And if it, 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 yeah, it's yeah, it was rough. And of course Grady Little gets fired. Yeah. And all right, let's go ahead and end end it with talking about the curses lifted in two thousand four. So Dave Roberts Pinch runner. Oh, steel. Always That's, be known as the steel, right? In a yeah, red the steel. Floor. You don't yeah. need to say anything else. I mean, and this is off of Mariano Rivera. Basically, God was on the mound. And the first pitch home, the first pitch home. And he came close one time. He, everybody in the stadium knew Roberts was going, but he just, he got in Mariano's head. Yeah, I mean, so I think one of the things that gets forgotten is that Kevin Pilar, uh, Pilar, Kevin Millar walks to get a board. Yeah. Robert comes in to pinch run. Then yeah. he steals. Yeah. Second. And, and there were two outs, right? Am I wrong with no, that? No, Millar was the first at bat. Oh, man. Yeah. So I missed Millar the was the first batter. Of that man, game. I mean, I'd have come out of my shoes. I'd be like, "What are you doing? You're gonna get thrown out." <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> One thing I do remember is it was a very close play. Yeah, I, I misremember things sometimes. I I romanticize them a little more. There was two outs. It was snowing sideways. <laughs> in the sky, and he was, he was running uphill. And the thing is, that was the perfect pitch for Posada to throw off of too. Yeah. But he throws it just to the inside, the, the shortstop side, instead of the, if he throws to the second base side, he's out. But Jeter had to swipe instead of just tag. And that was it. Yeah. I mean, ugh, we set the yeah. work. So obviously we can't share the video for obvious reasons, but the uh, the tag is so close. It is so very close. That's why I guess I, I I guess I remembered it being. I thought there was two outs because if it was if he's thrown out, I was thinking the the series is over. But no, it just but it would have been a rally killer. Yeah, yeah, we had to get a runner in scoring position. Had to. I mean, Mariano Rivera was on the mound, man. You know, hits were. Few and far between off that guy. And right. But and another thing that happened weird in that series in that set though was that I don't think Tory Joe Tory did this the entire year, but he brought Mariano in to pitch in the eighth, and then he came back out in the ninth. 
Now, I know he did that a few times over his career, but yeah, uh, to your point, he, he was trying to slam the door. I, I, forgive me, I can't remember if we brought this up, but, but they were down three games to nothing. Yeah, was, was, and was, we had just lost at Fenway 19-8. to eight. Right, it was blowout city. Freaking A-Rod. Stupid A-Rod. Oh, killed us. Just, I mean, murdered us. Um, it was hor- 19 to 8. I mean, if there's a Red Sox fan out there that's like, hey, I knew we were coming. He's lying. He's lying. I was like, let's just not get swept at this point. Right. You know, no one had ever done it. Kevin Millar was going to every stupid Dan Shaughnessy, the worst beat writer in Boston, was calling them phonies in the paper and everything. Kevin Millar's going to anybody that would listen. Hey, don't let us win tonight. Don't let us win tonight. Don't let us. We win tonight. We got Schilling going tomorrow. Pedro the next day. Everybody's going on the seventh game. Everybody. He went to Dan Shaughnessy and he's like, hey, don't let us win tonight. And if we do, I want you to retract that phony statement. And Shaughnessy like walked off the field. We set the record for the longest game that night and then broke it the following night. And correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't uh, David Ortiz have two 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 big flies in in those last four games that were like wasn't he wasn't he a big part of them making this comeback? Yeah, he yeah. hit the home run to end game four. He hit it in the Red Sox bullpen. That was after then, they tied it. After uh, that was after it was a tie game, right? After yeah. Robert Sport, yeah, okay. yeah. It went to like the thirteenth or something like that. It was after midnight before the game was over, and Ortiz just bah! and over Sheffield's head. And then the next night, Damon was on second, and Poppy came up, and it was like the fourteenth inning in this one. And over five hours, uh, and Ortiz hits a line drive over second base, and Joe Buck says, and Johnny can keep on running to New York. And uh, So I don't know if I've ever told you this or not, but I essentially lost a girlfriend over those playoffs, over the, over the 2004 uh, postseason. Because when the Red Sox started coming back, hated the Yankees for a lot of reasons, mainly because they'd beaten the Braves in the World Series twice, right? Screw Jim Layritz. Um, <laughs> I hate that guy, man. Hey, you ruined 96. We would have been back-to-backs. But so I'm watching the, the Red Sox get about to get swept. They win that, that first game. Was game two close or one of one of the games Boston beat the hell out of the Yankees? The game seven. Okay. So were the other two close or, or the you know game four, five, and six all were close? Six, we go to New York and we win four to two, I think. Okay. And then game seven, Johnny Damon hits a uh, home run. He had six RBIs. He hit a grand slam in like the third inning. And like you see, they showed Billy Crystal up in his booth in old Yankee Stadium. And Billy Crystal's head just hits the desk. <clears throat> All these Yankee fans are making Red Sox faces. Like we're like, I know that look. Oh my God. We, right. That's, that's our thing, you know, because they're just like, how is this happening? What? Wait a minute. The, is it opposite day? What's happening? And you should. All the big stars were there. You know, they're all for the gang and everything. Johnny Damon just, and to quote Joe Buck, Johnny Damon's going off. <laughs> I mean, he hit that sec that second homer of the game was a grand slam. He put it in the upper deck in Yankee Stadium. Now it's a short port side. Still though. He got Ted three three was the final of that game. Okay. I, I just pulled it up. Yeah, it was. Yeah. We rolled over him. Uh, and Derek Jeter says he still can't talk about that series. Derek Lowe was uh, on that Red Sox team. 
He wouldn't. He didn't make the playoff roster. He didn't pitch at all, Derek Lowe. In the playoffs, no, he didn't make the roster. He was sucking up. Yeah, oh. D'Lo came in for the World Series and pitched. A okay, Jim. I thought I remembered him in the World Series, but but he wasn't in the rest. Is that what you're saying? No, no. Okay, no, he was in the World Series. He pitched game uh uh seven game four and of game the four series. I'm sorry. Wasn't he the guy that won the game four? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I was about and to say because uh, game six was uh the bloody sock Derek, game. That Derek, was Lowe, Derek Lowe got the win in game seven against the Yankees. Yeah, but he didn't go. He was he didn't make the playoff roster until the ALCS, and then he he wins both the siding games. He was just terrible uh, okay. into the season. So, so, so you're saying he wasn't on the original playoff roster. Right, right. No, he, and then I mean, he wound yes. up. He won uh, game three of the uh, series in Anaheim. No. Yes, I'm looking at it. He he won all three deciding games. I just watched the DVD yesterday. I'm looking of- at it right here. Derek Lowe beats the Angels. Maybe he didn't make the original roster and they added him. Yes. I'm looking at it right here. Yeah, I he don't won think- like I know he won the game seven. He, and he, he would have been in the bullpen. He would have been in the bullpen in game three because he got the win and that game went ten innings, eight to six. So he obviously didn't start. You know, this is no. a long time ago. This wasn't 1902. He wasn't in the game as a starter in the tenth inning. <laughs> No. <laughs> no. Especially after giving no. up six runs like that, that would that didn't happen. I don't no. I don't care I don't I don't care what the old head tells you at the bar that, that didn't happen back then. No. One uh, he was all three deciding games. He he got the win for against the Angels for game three to complete the sweep. He won game seven for the Yankees, and he won game four for uh, against the uh Red Sox. Because I remember being excited when, when he became an Atlanta Brave because I knew that he was their, you know, he was their guy. Yeah. The bloody sock game. We can't bypass that game. Game six in New York, they shelled Schilling. Yeah. Game two in New York. He goes out there, he had surgery that morning his tendon sheathed over goes what seven gives up nothing. He's, he barely, he made Ruben Sierra look like a little leaguer that game. Ruben Sierra didn't make contact in four at bats again. It was in, you know, what's amazing about this that I, I kind of forget is that Kevin Brown was on that damn Kevin Brown got the loss in game seven of that Yankee series. Kevin Brown. Yeah. Was- oh, yeah. Kevin, I hated Kevin Brown. Kevin Brown was on the 98 Padres. We couldn't hit him. The Braves. Well, Hell, they made, they literally made a country song about the 98 Braves. And I still say it was because of Kevin Brown. And I kind of forgot well, that, you know, he was on that Padres team in 98 that gets swept by the Yankees. And then he's on that Yankees team in 04 that gets essentially swept after a three game lead by the Red Sox. Yeah, that, um, and you know what? Even if we wouldn't have won the World Series that year, to me, the curse was broken then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But hey, it, it's, so to put a cap on that on, on, on that thought real quick because we got a jam, but I'm dating this chick. <laughs> she's she's a Cardinals fan. I started Boston to come back to make the miracle comeback. And game when it gets to game six, the bloody sock game, but before it, I tell another buddy of mine who's a Cardinals fan, it's like, dude. It's Red Sox come back and win this. Holy cow. And the the 
Cardinals were heading to the World Series. I, I don't care, man. Go Cardinals. I was like, dude, I'm pulling for the I'm pulling for the Red Sox. This is gonna be awesome. This is gonna be awesome. Like, this team can't come back and kill the curse and then and then spit the bit in the World Series. So we had this long conversation that night, drinking and whatnot. When the Cardinals are down three games to none and they're in the game four, we're all hanging out, and this dude gets blotto and he's sitting there with what will, will, will be his future wife. They're sitting there doing shots. He finally screams out across the bar to me and the girl that I was seeing, and screw McGee. <laughs> <laughs> and the girl goes, what? And she's like decked out. Cardinals goes, he's pulling for the Red Sox. I didn't want to tell you all damn time. He's pulling for the damn Red Sox. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> she pours me. I've. I eventually cave and told the truth. Oh, <laughs> um, you didn't need her anyway. <laughs> no, but that's fine. We would run in each other for years because we lived in the same town. When well, I'd run into her, anything, anything to break the ice, you know, and she's like, hey, how's it going? I was like, I'm just thinking about those 2004 Red Sox. <laughs> Uh, she was a lucky woman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is your walk off, sir? Okay, for my walk off for this episode specifically, the minute I knew the World Series was in the bag was game one when they called out Steven Tyler to sing the national anthem in Fenway. I was like, Series is ours. Go home, St. Louis. It's over. It's the best day of my life. Steven Tyler singing. The Red Sox are going to win the World Series. It was a rip, big moon the night of the game four. And, oh, yeah. That's so we can thank Steven Tyler for the World Series curse being broken. Well, I knew it was over when my buddy yelled across the bar. <laughs> I knew it was over. That is an indicator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that the Cardinals were going to have to pull, pull, pull a Red Sox and get come back from three down. <laughs> we were still immediately after that. Ah, you win some, you lose some. All right, brother. <laughs> it was great doing this with you. I'll see you next time. All right, buddy. Goodbye, sweetheart. Well, it's time to go. We're back tomorrow with another show. Well, unless we fire, we'll talk to you then. Goodbye, sweetheart. Goodbye. Goodbye. Guys and gals, it's time to go. We'll see you on the next show. Same back time, same back channel. Thanks for listening to Braves Country with Mac McGee and the Armchair Quarterbacks on 99.1 FM WQEE, The Key in Noonan, Georgia, and simulcasting on youtube.com forward slash at Braves Country. <laughs> Braves Country comes your way weekdays, 3 p.m. Eastern to 5 p.m. Eastern. Please follow, like, and subscribe today. Armchair Quarterback Radio, your first choice. For Southern Sports. Something of the 5th of September. Something of the 5th of September. She said a lot that I can't remember. Something of the 5th. Can I get another cigarette, please? Can I get another cigarette, please? Yeah, I know I live to regret it. Just give me another cigarette, please. Hey! You're listening to WQEE 99.1 FM, the key in Noonan, Georgia.